Hi, everybody, and welcome. That's right, I'm going to stand here in front of you. Welcome to Congregation Share in Israel. Welcome to our book salon series. I'm Rabbi Jessica Zimmerman Grab. And I grew up going to this lady's house from time to time. So we have all been around together for a really long time. Um, it came to my attention as I was talking to you guys and the two of you and Emmy's mom and all these awesome people in our community that we had these really incredible authors who've written very different kinds of books and who published in the last year who are in our midst. So um, I'm going to read you the official biographies of these two lovely people who barely need an introduction. Daniel Handler is the author of seven novels, including Why We Broke Up, All the Dirty Parts, and Bottle Road. As Lemony Snicket is the author of far too many books for children, including Poison for Breakfast, the four-volume All the Wrong Questions, and the 13-volume A Series of Unfortunate Events, which has been adapted for screen and television. He lives in San Francisco with the illustrator Lisa Brown, to whom he is married, and their kid, and now going off script, their kid, comma, Otto, who had his bar mitzvah here, was completely awesome. As did I. I also had my bar mitzvah. I just so cool, so did I. And there are some people who went to our bar mitzvah here. I mean, it's not. Our mother. 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 Our Rude. Yeah. They could have had a chicken. So rude. And Otto is the cousin of Willa and Simone, who had their video with here very recently. It's super amazing to have three generations of this incredible family here. I am now going to share with you the bio of our other handler author. Rebecca Handler is a writer who lives and works in San Francisco. Rebecca's stories have been published and awarded in several anthologies. And she blogs regularly. Edie Richter is not alone. Is her debut novel it was long listed for the Center for Fiction First Novel Prize. In a star review, Kirkus writes, a tragicomic exploration of the collateral damage of Alzheimer's disease. Handler gets it right from the title on out. Edie is definitely not alone. Rebecca was recently awarded a McDowell Fellowship and spent the month of April in New Hampshire writing her second novel, which we can't, can't wait to hear about. We went to kindergarten together, we went to Israel together, and we are delighted to have you guys here tonight. So thank you so, so much. Thank you. Jessica, Rabbi Jessica was so cute in kindergarten. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. She's I mean, pretty cute now. She's but, still beautiful, but. Yeah, you guys should have seen her. She was a little peanut. Should have seen her back in kindergarten before, kind of, whatever. We all have <laughs> So after this, if people aren't in a hurry to leave, they can walk down the hall and see our photos in our synagogue confirmation pictures yeah, on the wall. We look exactly the same. Yes. It's a lot of Laura Ashley. <laughs> for me. Yeah, not so much for me. Yeah. No. Mine was uh, Young Man's Fancy. So, oh, yeah, yeah, Young Man's yeah. Fancy. Young Man's Fancy sold one book. It sold a book, and it was my least favorite book, I used to say, because it was the book that you could just, they sold it every day. You could read one, you could leaf through it while your hard working parents were paying for your blue blazer. What book was it? It was called Stand Up, Shake Hands, and Say How Do You Do. <laughs> it was manners for boys. For young men. And it was the worst. Teaching them how to be fancy. Yeah, taught you how to hammer the fun out of any possible encounter. <laughs> yeah. We have one at Laura Ashley called Sit There and Look Pretty. <laughs> that was actually the original name of the store. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Thank you all for being here. Yes, thank you. You're sweet. We're going to have some fun tonight. Um, Daniel and I wrote some questions for each other. And Daniel put those questions on little index cards, I believe, and then stored them in his... Thomas bag. Thomas bag. So I'm Get it? mix them up. Because we're at a synagogue. I think <laughs> it's the first time that my Thomas has ever been out of the bag and not on me. It was a weird feeling. True. Have you worn your Thomas? No? It's not really. No. Wear. 
asking the rabbit, she's looking at me like, mm -mm, no, okay. Is it cold midway? Then no. Right. <laughs> and if it were cold midway, shouldn't we be doing cold midway <laughs> instead of the literary salon? Yes. All right, it's my talk back, so I'm going to drop Okay, off. so we're going to ask each other some questions. At some point, we're going to read a little bit from our novels. Yeah. And then we'll take some questions. If anyone has questions for us. This one's fine. You're my first. Mm -hmm. You're my first? Yeah. How peculiar a person are you? <laughs> um, like on a scale from one to ten. Sure. I'd say I'd say I'm a, if ten is the most peculiar. Right. I'd I'd say I'm like a four or five. Okay. I think that's a little low. <laughs> I would say you are the more peculiar between the two of us. I feel like I am a little more um, socially mainstream okay. than you. Is that fair? Yeah. But I still wouldn't, I still wouldn't go all the way down to four. <laughs> I show very well. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> I was thinking like publicly peculiar in round four. Privately, maybe an eight. <laughs> right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Right. My turn? Yeah. <laughs> Dad used to visit synagogues wherever we traveled. Should we do that? <laughs> I actually have a story about that. I thought you might. Um, I know this is technically a question for you. Oh, right. So do you want to answer first? No, pleasure. So, um, I was recently in Seville, Spain, um, because my daughter was doing a two-week school program there, and we stayed at a hotel, and it was a Friday. And I remembered that Dad would have tried to seek out like a Shabbat service, or at least visit a synagogue if we were in Europe on a Friday. Right. And so I asked, um, the lady at the hotel is, um, are there a lot of Jewish people in Seville? And she said, actually, you're staying in what used to be the Jewish quarter. And I said, oh, is there a synagogue there? And she said, uh, no. So I did not go to it. It used to be the Jewish <laughs> right. quarter. Yeah, they all moved away. Um, should we go to synagogues when we travel, or do you? I don't know, I was just traveling, and I, and I, uh, and I thought to myself, our dad would have looked at the synagogues here, and I thought, I wonder if I will do that, and then I didn't do it. Um, Daniel and I, a few years ago, took a brother-sister trip together to Hobart, Tasmania. It was really fun. Do go if you get the chance. Um, I was living in Perth, Australia, plug for my book. Oh, that's, yeah. that's where I wrote my book, and a big chunk of it takes place in Perth. And Daniel came to meet me there with his family, and then he and I went on our own trip to Tasmania, which was really, really fun. Yeah, we we did not time. seek out a synagogue. No, I don't even think we looked it up. There might be one in Hobart. If it was going to be anywhere in Tasmania, that's where it would be. Yeah. But we went on a cruise called the Seafood Seduction. Seafood cruise. Seduction. <laughs> and it was all uh, romantic couples oh and us. Nice. <laughs> you drove all around really very beautiful, the beautiful bay of, uh, of Tasmania, all of various waterways, and um, they jump off the boat and fetch you oysters. Or the, and it it's was, like a day cruise. Yeah, it was quite nice. Really special. Yeah, it was lovely, but it was true that we were up a little... It was really weird. Yeah. <laughs> People would say, how long have you been together? And we'd say, about 50 years. Yeah. <laughs> We were child, bride, and groom. <laughs> yeah, no, it was a bad feeling. Yeah. The other thing I remember about that trip is that we assumed that the song Rock Lobster by the b 52s was an international hit, where it seems that it was more really local. <laughs> because we were served Rock Lobster. Oh boy. And I think if you're American of a certain generation and you hear the phrase Rock Lobster, you're going to sing the song Rock Lobster by the b 52s obviously. And we were like... Da -na 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 -na. Yeah, other people, like, what, you've already made fools of yourself 18 times, why are you doing that? That's question. Okay, what's my question? Okay, right. 
Why should people buy your sibling's book? <laughs> I wrote that question. I know. But I read now I have to answer your it. Um, so I have read all of my brother's books um, eagerly, like the minute they come out, except for one. I just told him tonight I have not yeah. read all the dirty parts um, because there's a lot of sex in it, and that's gross because he's my brother, and so I didn't want to read it. Yeah, it's not about me or anything. So, I'm just saying that because I've read all of his books, although I am his sister and bias, I do, I have seen his growth as a writer, and it's been amazing to witness as your sister and also read as a reader. And I can honestly say that Poison for Breakfast, you should hold it up, um, is my favorite, I think, yeah? of your books. Aww. Well, We Are Pirates is probably is right up there. And uh, I think Poison for Breakfast is good. You should read, you should buy Poison for Breakfast and read it because it is a book um, that does have a storyline, a through storyline, but it is really a book of philosophy. Um, and it makes you um, think a lot. And you can read one or two pages before bed and have really beautiful dreams. Oh, wow. That's a good. Thanks for the question. Sure. And uh, we'll throw in a set of steak knives. Yeah. <laughs> We've actually announced a special working partnering with uh, our pal at uh, our pals at Green Apple Books that uh, it's a sibling special. If you buy one book by me and one book by Rebecca, uh, you get them for the price of both of the cover prices of those books combined. So it's a, it's a, it's a savings. We have neither of us have calculators with us, so we're not sure about the savings, but you will not believe the savings. <laughs> no. Oh, sorry, turn, turn. Thanks for the question. Why should people buy my book? Um, that's a good, yeah, it's a good follow-up question. Um, well, I'll, I'll as you did, up. I'll speak of my experience of it first, which is that you said you were writing uh, your uh, your blog and some other little pieces here and there when you were living in Australia, and you told me that you were had been working on a book, a novel, and uh, which delighted me. I felt like I finally got you. Like I was like, see, it's really fun. And then um, you sent it to me, and I was um, I, I like devoured it in no time. It was a kind of a really bad, but not super early. And um, I thought it was just so elegant and thoughtful and, um, and light. I think it's like a, it's a book that, you, that, is, that is easy to read, which is an underrated uh, skill. And um, it's lovely, it's a lovely thing to read. I can't imagine anyone picking up your book and not finishing it. Thank you. Do you want to say one more nice thing? Because I felt like that was fine. <laughs> um, uh, it's funny. Always good. Uh, it is funny. Yeah. Um, funny book about Alzheimer's. Yeah. I don't. That's because I don't. I never yeah. really thought of it. As that's a book what the Chronicle said, though. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but but it, and it is about Alzheimer's, and our father uh, had Alzheimer's, and um, that's a tough uh, row to hoe. Both of you have it, and if, if someone you love has it. Um, but I always thought the book was just about Evie. I always thought the book was about a woman who um, does something that haunts her and is unable to talk about it. And about kind of being, being haunted, no matter what you're doing, by something that's bothering you, and then um, finding courage just feels like not quite the right word, but like the pluck kind of and to liberate yourself by being able to talk about it, by, by figuring out that you should talk about things that are haunting you. That's what I was thinking about. So it was funny when it came out and then the reviews were like, it's a book about Alzheimer's. And I was like, oh yeah, I guess it is. Yeah, Alzheimer's is like the hook that a lot of people talk about. Yeah, and um, when um, dad was diagnosed and, and not doing well, so many people were pushing books 
that tall by Merlami, and um, which was not what I wanted at all. I was kind of like, I get, I, I get that. that. That's being taken care of. That topic is being discussed in my brain already. I like to read other things. So maybe that's also why I think with my Alzheimer's is that I put, I, I, for a while I literally had a stack of books and then I got rid of them that people gave me. They were like, helping you think about Alzheimer's, Daniel. I was like, but I'm already thinking about it all the time. I don't want to think about it anymore. I actually remember when I told you that I was going to write a book. Oh, yeah? I remember, I remember the night. So I um, came to writing fiction in my 40s. So my professional life has been, I was in fundraising for about 20 years, and then I work in philanthropy now with foundations and their grant making. So I've always done writing professionally um, and enjoyed it, but never really occurred to me to write fiction. And then I, when I moved to Australia with my family, we moved there temporarily because my husband was offered a job in Perth. Um, I began this blog sort of as a way to explore living in another country and to share stories and, um, and that sort of took off and I was having a lot of fun with it. And then I was just playing around with different characters and scenarios and you actually said, oh, you should try fiction because I realized it's sort of in my blog I bumped up against like real life. Like I had no interest in sort of writing, you know, tell all or exposing anyone else's lives or secrets or anything. So I thought, well, there's only so much I want to write on here. And I was talking to you about it. And you're like, well, you know, that's what fiction's for. <laughs> you can explore a lot in fiction that you can't in nonfiction. And so I started writing short stories and um, had a few of them published, which was great, and won, won an award. And that gave me like motivation to keep going. And then I had the seed of an idea for a story that was inspired by um, my father's experience with Alzheimer's and all our family's experience with this disease. Um, and I had the seed, and I started writing a story, and then it was getting longer and longer. And I thought, you know what? I think I'm just going to try to write a novel. And you and I were in Hobart. Do you remember? Uh, I mean, no. We were at, so we were at, so it was when we were in Hobart, we went to a Chinese restaurant. I do remember the Chinese restaurant. That was delicious. It was delicious. And what's the one thing you remember about that restaurant? Um, the, our server. Our server had a name tag on, and the name tag said "trainee," mm -hmm. which looked funny. Funny. It, it made it, it look like her name. Was it made it look like her name, and it made it made you know you're like, that doesn't, is that it's not Chinese? <laughs> no, no. No, oh, she's the trainee. trainee. Yeah. yeah. So we were at Trainee's restaurant and We had our picture taken with her, which she did not enjoy. And I think I, I felt a little I felt a little sheepish telling telling you that I was gonna try to write a novel. And uh, you were so supportive. You were wonderful. Yeah, I think that's great. People, people are wonderful. People are often nervous to tell me that they're writing. <laughs> Um, like I'm gonna be like, that's my thing. Yeah. <laughs> like, there's only one writer in the world. It's me. <laughs> um, but that is not how I feel. <laughs> Thank you for being supportive. You're welcome. Um, okay, who's next? Why don't you read a little bit from the book? Because now you've told a little story of its creation. Um, I'll read the first. So the book. I have to take off my take off my glasses to read. Um, I feel like I'm like the opposite of most people my age when I take off my class history. Um, there is a prologue to this book that I'm going to skip. And I'm going to go straight to chapter one and read the first few pages. <clears throat> my dad was acting strange long before he was diagnosed. He would leave me phone messages. Edie, it's your father. He'd say, I can't find the top to the plastic thing. I need it for the batteries. I opened all the little walls and it's nowhere. You know, Edie, it's the top to the plastic thing. It's for the batteries. I was living in Boston, newly married, and working in marketing for an anti-hunger nonprofit. My parents and younger sister, Abby, were back home in San Francisco. Abby discovered thousands of black plastic coffee stirrers in dad's bedside drawer. He bought five pairs of the same brown loafers and lined them up next to the fireplace. He was 63. 
Mom took Dad to a neurologist and called me. <clears throat> they never know for sure, she said, but it looks like Alzheimer's. I was at work writing about a fourth grader in Detroit whose only reliable meal was a subsidized school lunch. I snuck into an empty conference room and closed the door as Abby continued wailing in the background like she had just run over a baby. Mom went in the other room to get away from the noise. Apparently, the doctor gave him all sorts of tests, like pattern recognition and basic math. He failed every one of them. He couldn't even draw a Christmas tree, Mom said. He's Jewish, I replied, <laughs> rubbing a pencil mark off the table. I worked with slobs. I didn't think I was old enough to have a parent with Alzheimer's. I'd never even considered it. The only person I knew with Alzheimer's was a former sociology professor at college. Years after he retired, he still called the department office to reserve meeting rooms. According to his former assistant, he was living in a nursing home and had bitten off most of his fingernails. Dad got on the phone and tried to be funny. Guess what, Edie? I am crazy after all. It's official, I told him, trying to match his tone. You're nuts. That I am, he said. We had nothing else to say, so I told him I loved him. After we hung up, I returned to my desk and changed the gender of the fourth grader from a girl to a boy. Later, I went swimming at the community center near my office. Underwater, I repeated the word Alzheimer's over and over. I tried it in a German accent. I tried it with a lisp. I swallowed a bunch of water. My husband, Oren, and I had plans later that night, a farewell thing for one of his colleagues, a woman with a mom name who wore cashmere cardigans and covered her mouth when she laughed. After my swim, I headed to the bar near downtown Crossing. The room was loud and a baseball game was on. Oren was already tipsy. I tapped him on the shoulder as he was signaling for another drink and said, my dad has Alzheimer's. What? He said, shrugging his shoulders apologetically and pointing to the speakers in the ceiling. Mom called. I said loudly, my dad has Alzheimer's. She got a Weimaraner? <laughs> I leaned closer to him and spoke slowly into his ear. Alzheimer's. Eyes bulging, he stared at me. I nodded. Oh God, Edie, let's get out of here. He grabbed our coats from the bar stool and a moment later we were outside on Tremont Street in the cold. Why are we here? Orange shouted, shoving a black beanie over his head. What is wrong with you? He was drunk and suddenly very sad. I just told you my dad has Alzheimer's. Oren looked up at the dark sky, down at the sidewalk, and then said quietly, I know what you just told me, Edie. I just can't believe you told me here, at a bar. He shook his head and pulled me close. We got a taxi and went home. I wonder who drank our beer, I said, pulling my nightgown over my head. What? said Oren in bed, already half asleep. Never mind, I said, flipping over my pillow to the cold side and lying down. Oren moved closer to me and draped his arm across my chest. I love your dad, he said, and kissed my shoulder. I'm so sorry. I wished his body could swallow mine. You want to choose a question? Uh, yeah, it's my turn. turn. What do you think about when you swim? Uh, so, um, Rebecca and I both swim in the bay regularly. Um, we and it felt like a thing that we did um, after. Dad died, even though our father never in a million years would have done such a thing. <laughs> um, but at least we, we learned, which is not unusual for us, that we had both been thinking about the same thing. We both had been thinking for years that we wanted to try swimming in the bay. And then um, I, I have a very specific memory of swimming laps at um, the JCC pool, and always, which I never enjoyed doing. 
Like, I like swimming, but I, did, but I was like, oh, I wish I could swim in the bay, but it's impossible. I can't possibly be able to swim here at this pool and not enjoy myself. And then, um, shortly after that, I remember I got out of the water and I thought, what are you waiting for? And we went and we took, we took a class together. We took a class, which is... Like an open water swimming class. It's an class. open water swimming class. And they, it's kind of like if you decided to go for a hike in Muir Woods and you took a class on climbing Everest. <laughs> like they teach you a class about like, Here's if you're if you're swimming the channel, here's what you're doing. And so that that was 90% of the class. And then one of the things that was funny. Signs of hypothermia. Right, signs of hypothermia, which is not what happens to you when you first are swimming in the bay. Um, and then what I my clearest memory is that the woman said, like, and people think that you shouldn't eat before you swim, but you really should. You should have that energy. And then she put she took out a Tupperware container that had a slice of cake in it. <laughs> As if we would not know to what demonstrate eat, what he was. <laughs> yeah. She's like, you should eat something. Like, for instance, this is an edible thing here. <laughs> and that was funny to me. Um, By the way, it's about the it's it's about the warmest the bay will get right now. Yeah, so if, if you, you want to try, that, you if you've try. been thinking about taking a dunk, yeah. So you should do it. I'll meet you down there. And then also, um, we it was a and so we, we would do it together, but we did it separately a lot too. But then when COVID hit, uh, we started doing it. We, we were like crazy maniacs doing it. So we're members of the Dolphin Club, which is down by your Yellow Square. Are you a member of the Dolphin Club? Hi. 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 Welcome. Welcome. Nice to meet you. Um, so b before COVID, we would be able to go to this club where we could store our clothes, and then they have a hot sauna that you can go in after. So then COVID hit, and the club had to close down, but we still wanted to go swimming. And we thought it might not ever open again because it was a sauna full of old people, and we just thought, like, that's, the, that's like COVID central. <laughs> There's nothing. Yeah, like, when will a sauna full of old people be safe again? The answer is never. We were all in. You know, in the early COVID, where it was like, Disneyland will never open again. And now we're like, oh, sure, who cares? Yeah. And we said, who needs a sauna when you have a car heater? Yeah, so we, so we drove down together and we went early in the morning so we could park near the water and we would go into the water and then we would come out again and change underneath the um, poncho. The poncho. I mean, underneath two ponchos, to be clear. We would each use our own ponchos. Individual ponchos. Um, while listening largely to late babies R&B. It looked absolutely absurd. That would get about a nine or a 10 on the peculiarity scale. You see, you can't, yeah. You ain't no four, honey. So what do you- I've met fours, I've worked with fours. You're a seven. So what do you think about when you swim? Um, what's best is when I think about nothing, which happens when it's the coldest and when you're kind of working the hardest, the way I think any, um, other kind of exercise or very intense activity is where it kind of chases everything out. That's kind of my favorite thing, is that it's totally blank. But then um, I'm pretty good at giving myself an assignment or something to think about. Um, and it's really good for my work if I'm struggling with something. So is the assignment usually something that you're working on in writing? Yeah. Almost always, I would say. Or like, I need a special shirt. Where am I going to buy it? Sometimes it's a birthday present. That's a good thing to think about. It's a birthday present. Um, people often think that I'm going to get bored when I swim. Yeah. They say, don't you get bored? I say, nope. Yeah, I, I don't, don't get bored. I got really bored during laps. When I used to swim laps, the thing that I tried to do to keep myself from getting bored is that I would, you know, I would number them. I don't know why I said that. I would number them. I would count them. That's what I would do. But I would, and I would try to really remember what I was like the year of the, the match the number. Like if it was my seventh lap, I tried to be like, okay, you're seven. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah. But then um, I was doing more laps than I was old. And so then I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm 77 on that. The okay. morning of our dad's funeral, I went to, like before the funeral, I went to USF and I swam 82 laps in honor of him. I remember. Yeah. Um, um, I'm going to read a little bit from yeah. Poison Perfect. Because There's actually a, swimming at. I was going to say, are you reading the swimming part? part of the swimming a little bit. It is said that there are three rules for writing a book. 
The first rule is to regularly add the element of surprise, and I have never found this to be a difficult rule to follow, because life has so many surprises, but the only real surprise in life is when nothing surprising happens. Perhaps you were surprised to read at the end of the previous chapter that I jumped into the cold and swirling water, which means I managed to follow the first rule of writing a book. But truth be told, I was just as surprised to find myself plunging into the sea. It was the sort of decision you make so quickly it does not even feel like you were deciding, just that you have already decided. One moment I was standing on a rock, thinking if, if how I were poisoned, long story, I might not have many more chances to swim here at this particular spot, and the next I was in the water. The second rule is to leave out certain things in the story. This rule is trickier to learn than the first, because while life is full of surprises, you can't leave any part of life out. Everything that happens to you happens to you. Often boring, sometimes exhausting, and occasionally thrilling, every moment of life is unskippable. In a book, however, you can just skip past any part you do not like, which is why all decent authors try not to have any of these parts in the books they write. But few authors manage it. Nearly every book has at least one part that sits on the page like a wet sock on the ground, with the reader stopping to look at it thinking, what is this doing here? This is why I left out the part where I removed most of my clothing before jumping into the sea, because no sensible reader is interested in things of that nature. If Little Red Riding Hood, the hero of an old folk tale, needed to use the bathroom while she was walking through the forest to see her grandmother, that is her business. Which is why just about all of the books about her leave out that part. If Oedipus, the hero of a famous play, had an inch he couldn't scratch and it really bothered him, that is not something we ne necessarily want to read about, so it should happen off stage where we want to hear about it. And I can't find a good reason to tell you exactly what I was wearing or if it required unbuckling or unbuttoning or if I folded things neatly or just dropped them on a heap on the rocks by the shore. So I followed the second rule of writing the book and left it out. Nobody knows the third rule. <laughs> I've noticed something that you do in your writing is you have, um, and I don't know if it's just, I guess it's more in your Lemony Snake and stuff than in your Daniel Handler stuff, but you have like lists of things. Like there are three things about this, there are four things about this. And it's just occurring to me now that I've not ever asked you about why or how that started or if you can even answer that or if like you, know going into it, okay, there's three things that I'm going to write, or two things, and like, the use of numbers and lists. Um, I mean, I guess I like them, is the short answer. I was just thinking, when, when you started asking that, I was thinking of a time that I went to Vancouver, and um, I, some friends of mine took me to see this band play, and they were, um, it was a punk band made out of, uh, women, made out of women. It was made out of women. It looked like a punk band from afar, but when you got close, it was women. It was crazy. You took um, three women, yeah. you stick them together. And they were like, they painted their faces and ripped their clothing. It was like a, uh, and, and they, and it, it was horrible. Um, super loud and incomprehensible and uh, uh, crazy. But what I liked about it is they said, I can't remember what their name was, but they were like, we're so-and-so, and we're gonna play eight songs, and then we're gonna leave, and if you clap enough, we're gonna play one more. <laughs> and I was, that made it, the whole thing okay. Because then we'd just be like, what the you <laughs> And you'd be like, okay, that was one. <laughs> you know, and, and, and somehow, it, I really appreciated it. Yeah, they laid it out for you. Yeah. And afterwards, I told them that. They were friends of friends of mine, and so, and, and, and um, I don't think it was the best compliment they'd ever received. But I said, I really liked how you said, you should always do that. Always say that you're just going to play these songs and then do it. And I appreciate I, that in many a thing. I like it. I like how they sa it sounded like they invented the encore. Right. Like, and then, yeah, we, we do we're going to do this crazy thing. Yeah. Where if you keep clapping, we're going to come back play a bonus song. Or like, you know what a play, if there's a little sign that says there's one 15 minute intermission, and then you know the play's not over, which is not always the case. Sometimes you're like, oh, it's just ending, and then you're like, oh no, it's intermission, which can be good news or bad news, depending on your point of view. 
But um, but I so I kind of like being told it's but a little bit what's going to happen. I like that. It's a very snicket thing too to be very try to find some organization in something. Yeah. Try to find meaning in something. Yeah. Chaos. Well, it, it helps. I mean, with raising a, a kid, I think that was helpful to say. You know, when they're little, you say, like, I need you to put your shoes on and go get your bag, right? Or, like, we're going to go over to someone's house and there's going to be cookies there. You have to lay it out. And less of, like, life is no one knows what's going to happen at any minute. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah. I have two teenagers, when they were little, they shared a room, and we had problems for a little while uh, getting them to go to sleep. And I was reading in this sleep book, I believe it's called Healthy Sleep Habits, Happy Child. I was going to say happy, happy Life. Healthy Sleep Habits, Happy Child. It's like the only book that I actually found valuable in terms of raising kids. And they uh, suggested that you put, um, this only works for a certain age group. Um, you make three rules, and you write them down, and you post it in the kid's room, and they're called sleep rules. And the first rule is, close your eyes, be very quiet, and go to sleep. <laughs> and it totally- That's an example where you want to read all three of the rules before you do it, though. If you just do the first one, then you have no idea what the second two are. It absolutely worked. Yeah. Not every night, but we just be like, it's the rules. Right. Like it's just something to show. Like no shirt, no service. I don't know what to tell you. I was just telling the story that a million years ago when I was in a band, and we would pass around. You know, we'd play in little bars, and we would pass around a clipboard where you could write your postal address, because that's how long ago it was, in the 17th century, and you could get a little postcard the next time we played, and we always said, we have a policy, there's a policy, if you see one of our shows, you have to see all of them. <laughs> and then we were always like, those are the rules, like, that's the rules, but there's nothing we can do about it. You're going to have to go to the Edinburgh Castle over and over and over again, see us, sorry. I want to do a quick time check, so we have time for some questions. Would yeah. be a good time we agreed it would be questions. a three hour event. <laughs> Um, does, if anyone has a question, now would be a great time to ask it, but no pressure, we can also you know, ask for Yeah, we got more index cards, don't worry about it. Yes, and I will repeat the question, because I know this is being recorded, so yeah. Um, this is rather the obvious question, given the format, but do you think that um, literary ability is genetic or environmental, and if there's an environmental element, what do you think are the beneficial elements, uh, beneficial um, Aspects that, that help develop literary, literary talent and ability. Fun question. So the question was, um, do you think that literary ability is has a genetic component and or an environmental one? And sort of what environmental things we can all do so everyone writes books all the time? <laughs> or get them to stop. <laughs> it really depends on your point of view. Let's not go overboard with the encouragement of creativity. Well, so, not to uh, not to bring it down, but I will just for one moment. Is the the gravestone at our father's grave says uh, his name, Lewis Handler, and his birthday and the date of his death, and then it says loved a good story. Um, so that says a little bit about the kind of house that we grew up in, uh, where stories were valued. Um, our mom is here tonight, the beautiful blue sweater. And she has an amazing ability to tell a great story and an amazing appreciation for a great story. Um, and I would say humor was definitely like a competitive sport in our household. <laughs> and I'm not exaggerating. Like, it was, we were harsh and witty and fast, and you had to get in there. And one of the most frequent arguments that my husband and I have is that I interrupt him too much. And it's like something that I've been trying to work on for 20 years. And I keep saying it's because of how I was raised. I had to get in there. I had to, like, I had an older brother who was really funny and really quick. And I had a mother who was the same. And I had a mother who was the same way. And I had to just jump in. 
My husband doesn't care. He doesn't think that that's a good excuse. But. It so in that way, I would say there was a lot of about, you know, our environment growing up was like, we really appreciated good stories. Yeah. Um, I mean, in terms of writing, Daniel always knew, you always knew that you were going to be a writer. There's well, I always knew I wanted to be a writer. I don't, I, yeah. Yeah. It was made pretty clear to me that yeah. it was uh, not guaranteed. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I think he was encouraged to have another plan. Dad used but... to say, you can quit your successful medical practice when you're not in cells. <laughs> um, but what do, you, what do you think? Do you think there's a genetic component, or...? I don't know. I mean, I don't know. But I think... Um, I mean, it feels pretty, feels pretty deep-seated. Um, when Otto was little, really little, he um, loved books such that sometimes he would, he, was, he would fall and he would cry, but before he got in our lap, he would go and get a book because he knew that was like the thing that we would do to make, uh, to make it better. And, that, and I, think, I, mean, it's, well, I think it's one of the things when you have little kids, you can't believe there's stuff that doesn't feel like it could be environmental because there hasn't been an environment long enough. Mm -hmm. And so then it feels like it must be something else. Mm -hmm. But, I don't know, genetics is, always feels creepy, like in the, particularly in the Jewish space, to be like, it's genetics. Like, <laughs> that hasn't served us well in general, <laughs> that philosophy. I will say one of the best, for, for my writing, and um, one of the best things that I did in retrospect was major in anthropology in college, uh, which at the time, of course, see now I think it's a little more popular of a major, but at the time, back in the 90s, it was not very popular, and everyone seemed very confused as to why I would want to study anthropology when I don't want to be an anthropologist. And um, I think I think with like an anthropological lens all the time. So um, even now, like looking out at you, all of you beautiful faces, and my friend Allison who's sticking her tongue out at me, um, I, I'm able to kind of step back and just look at everyone and feel like an outsider for a moment. And I think I've always um, had that tendency to sort of be able to step back and analyze, which makes for great, um, like if I say that makes for great fiction, it sounds like I'm patting my own back, but it makes for good stories. It makes for really good stories. I, think. I just think there's, the the thing that is necessary to write fiction is a strange combination of paying attention and not paying attention, because you need to, you have to you're paying attention to some peculiarity or something that you are noticing, and it often means you're not paying attention to what is assumed you are paying attention to or what in fact you are supposed to pay attention to. That's a nice way of putting it. Yeah. yeah. Um. Any other questions? Yes. Um, In the back. <laughs> I yes. was wondering, do you ever have like a point where you don't know if you'll finish the book? Um, and then at one point, do you, like second draft, first draft, do you start feeling like, wow, this could actually be a book? I don't know if that makes sense. Why don't you take that? Because you've written more than one novel. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, the short answer is that it's uh, tough and there's not a magical formula. And um, Poison for Breakfast was written um, with this little bit of stolen time. I thought that I was going to be um, spending a whole summer in a, in a series of warehouses where a uh, production company was uh, filming a television adaptation of some of my work. And as has happened to me before, they said, actually, we'd like you nowhere near the warehouses. Please go away. <laughs> and so um, I went away, and I, and I thought, you know, we were like looking at apartments, so I spent there in the summer, and then I wasn't going to be there at all. And so um, I had this idea for this book, and I just wrote it, and, I, and no one knew that I was writing the book. I mean, my wife knew, but no one professional knew that I was writing it, and part of it was because I didn't know if it was a book, I didn't know if it would really work. And so I, and it was, a, it felt like a great luxury to do it. And then if it didn't work, I thought, oh, no one even knows that they did it, so it's not a disaster. You know, it felt like baking a cake, and no one knows you're baking a cake, and then if it's a disaster, you get home, and you're like, there's no dessert. Um, <laughs> as usual. Uh, so, but I think, I mean, if you write a book, you're going to feel 
I think, pretty manic about it at one point or another. I think it's impossible to write a book and not at one point think it's like going to be the best book, and then at another point think not only is it not going to be a best book, but it's actually like a notorious embarrassment. It will be it will be known the world over for being especially crummy. Um, but uh, Michelle T, who's a writer that I admire a lot, says, always says that it's like art class, you have to make a mess and then you have to clean up. And so, yeah, starting the messy part, which is like first draft, I was saying, I just put it all in, woo, let's try it all. And then, um, and then you have to clean up, which I find kind of more fun. I have to encourage myself to make a mess, but I'm, I'm, um, it comes more naturally to me to clean it up. I am much newer to this um, process, but I would say so far in my writing style, I tend to carve a lot out. So um, I once described it as feeling more like a sculptor than a writer. So like putting a bunch of stuff in a pile and then carving, carving, carving. So. I tend. I mean, this is a very slim novel. There's a lot of uh, a lot of deleted stuff, and so that's how it got to the this size. Because I just kept trimming, trimming, trimming. I want every sentence to matter. I I don't tend to like to read or write really, really long paragraphs. I like to have it really concise, really to the point. Um, so that's just how I that's how I write. Trim, trim, trim. But yeah, write a bunch of garbage first, and then trim it. Yeah. Yeah. Right before, so I, I had a little uh, uh, crisis with the book that was right before COVID. I'd written about 200 pages of the book, and um, and I like to write longhand, and I like to write, write away from the internet. But I was um, someplace, and I knew that there was a little fact that I uh, didn't know, and I was sure that it was. I just slipped my mind, and so I looked it up on my phone, which I really hardly, hardly ever do when I'm working, because it's bad to do that, I think, for me. And I saw the fact, which I had not known before, and it made the, the whole 200 pages not what I wanted to do at all. And it was a crazy feeling. And, uh, and I savored it because I think I had gotten a little bit into a pattern of self-hypnosis where I was like, you know what you're doing. You're not going to think I have this kind of thing. This was like a whole, uh, I could feel myself getting pale. I was in a cafe and I could feel the blood draining uh, from my face. And going someplace else, I just realized that's a strange. The blood drains from me, but it doesn't really drain from you. It stays somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> think about that later. <laughs> um, and so, but it, and that was a, it was a gift too. I thought this is exactly what you're supposed to do. 200 pages, it was worthless. Oh gosh. Yeah. That makes me really stressed out. And then COVID hit, so I was like, no, I really can't fix it. But now I'm going to fix it. Any other questions? Yes. Um, from the Dolphin Club. Yeah, in front of from the Dolphin. This is for Rebecca specifically. Um, I, had, I have two questions. The first is, like, what were your, I'd say, top three challenges with moving from short to long form? And then also, what, what challenges did you face in maintaining creative objectivity since your subject matter was so close to your real life? Ooh, um, so I'll try to repeat those questions. So the first one was, oh, going from short form to long form, how was that? And then also, uh, because I incorporated some aspects of my real life in the story, and it was inspired by, um, the death or the life and death of my father in a very, very loose way. Um, so how did I maintain objectivity? Did I get those right? Um, so short form to long form, um, it was really, really fun actually to, I mean, in short stories, I like writing really, really like micro fiction. That's really fun. I like to write like 500 to 1,000 word tiny stories. That's my sweet spot. And that's why I still um, like to post on my blog onewomanparty.com. Um, you can go there and see. You can go there and yeah. see a lot of stories. It's open 24/7. Yeah. <laughs> you can look under fiction. You can look under nonfiction. Um, and so that's my sweet spot. I really like writing those things, and I love reading things like that too. Um, so with longer form, for me, it was really great to be able to dive into a character and to make this woman Edie um, just. Hopefully, the reader sees this, but to, to make her a really, really rich, 
complex, interesting person and take my time and to create a backstory for her and memories for her and to really map that out. So that's what I enjoyed. I would say like getting into the character was really, really enjoyable. And at times during the writing of the first draft, I would, if I went like a few weeks without writing much in the book, I would almost like feel her there. Like in the, I know this sounds a little kooky, but we're in San Francisco, so I could say it. Um, I would feel Edie, like I could see her and picture her and feel like she was just waiting, like sitting in the corner, looking at me, being like, come yeah. on. That's four out of 10. <laughs> four out of ten. But I think everyone feels things like that. Um, don't they? I don't know. And then my number's gonna go up. I yeah. But yeah, I just I felt like I knew this woman and I wanted to do her service. So um, and in terms of yeah, I did make deliberate choices. Um, I made, I mean, my mom, before my mom read a draft, she was saying, oh, is there a mother in the book? What's she like? <laughs> what is she like? I made a um, deliberate choice to make Edie's mother very, very different from my own mom. And I made the choice for Edie to not have a brother. Um, and I wanted, I'm really interested in the sister relationship um, because that would have been a lot better for me than this, having this guy in my life. Just kidding. Who wanted to dig? Someone here wanted me to dig at him. That was my dig. It wasn't me. Oh, no, I've <laughs> um, no, always been really interested in sister relationships, so I thought it would be fun to write one. Um, so yeah, I made some choices, but obviously there's a lot. I mean, I, it takes place in San Francisco and Perth. I live in San Francisco and Perth. Um, there's a lot of overlap for sure. And I tried to make Edie very, very different from who I am as a person. I think I'm more like Edie's husband, in a way, than I am like Edie. Yeah, I mean, I don't, it, it's, yeah. It, you told me once, too, that like people um, always see themselves in your books, but they never see the right person. Yeah. Like, they're always like, oh, like, I'm Violet Baudelaire, and you're like, Oh, that's funny. You're actually Mr. Poe, but whatever. Yeah, no, people, yeah. people I know are always like, so I saw what you were doing there. I wasn't thinking about you at all. <laughs> but um, but one, one of the most valuable things that uh, my mother, who you know as well, uh, <laughs> said to me, she was driving me to a party once when I was in like, fifth or sixth grade, and I was a party, it wasn't given by um, someone at my school, so I wasn't gonna know a lot of people there, and I was um, nervous about it. And my mother said, remember, everyone is almost always thinking about themselves. And it was very helpful. Yeah. But I think of that when someone's like, I knew that you were thinking about what happened to my brother, and that's why it's in the book. And I'm like, no, you're thinking about what's happening to your brother. I'm not thinking about you. Notice something you, you had something in your teeth. I put that in a thing five years ago. Our mom also told me to always go to a party that you're invited to, even if you don't like who's hosting it, because you never know who's going to be there. Maybe there'll be someone nice. Yeah. I got that from my mother. She got it from her mother. Well, what or I passing did, it down. What I didn't learn until college, and it was so valuable to learn it, was leave the party while you're having fun. Yeah. Great Otherwise, you're stuck. <laughs> and then you don't have to be stuck there very long for you to have had a suddenly a terrible night, even though you didn't have you weren't having a terrible night most of the time. That sounds like a good segue to see how we are on time, because we don't want to overstay exactly. our welcome. Yeah. I think we're we're good. Good. You have a few more minutes. Are we good? Does anyone we have? We have one more card. We do have one more question. We'll do one more card. Anyone? Does anyone one more question. Okay. All right. Oh, and I just want to say that. The wonderful car from Green Apple Books is in the back, yeah. selling my novel and selling several of Daniel's novels. And if you already have our novel, that's awesome. And maybe you could get one for a friend. Yeah. <laughs> and we could sign it. Just because saying. Because among my spiritual beliefs, including many spiritual beliefs acquired in this building, is my belief that if you enter an independent bookstore and you leave without buying something, you're committing a sin. 
<laughs> and this tonight only, Bar Hall is a branch of the Grand Apple Book. <laughs> so if you do not buy something, you're a bad person. <laughs> And the rabbi is nodding. Yeah. Right. You're gonna, you're gonna argue with the rabbi over the nature of evil? No. You're gonna lose that one. You're gonna lose that one in a big way. Okay. So we'll do one more question. Okay. You want to choose it? Sure. And we'll both answer. Yeah. Make it a good one. If it's a bad one, I'm throwing it out. <laughs> Too goofy. Well, this seems like the appropriate one. Okay. Um, how does Judaism play a role in your writing? Mm -hmm. Yes, we had a couple of uh, Jewish-related questions, I think, in there that did not yeah. get pulled, so I'm glad that that got pulled. Um, I think the question that I put in was, are Jews funnier than non-Jews? Discuss. Yeah. <laughs> Um, well, I, I thought long and hard. That's question actually about that question. People ask me that. Yeah. Are you funny because you're Jewish? <laughs> or are you Jewish because you're funny? Um, here's what I do think is that there's a deep tradition of looking askance in Jewish culture, and that um, right, the, that the holiest work you can do is sit around arguing over some tiny point in a Jewish text. That's the, that's the really good work. And I think that um, funny is a form of looking askance at things. That's what I think. Right, like when you say the, when you said there, uh, there's a, a funny line that she has a mom's name. And you, Right, there's no such thing as mom's name, obviously. A mom can be named anything, but... Joyce. For instance. But, um, you can... But it, but the, the joke of that line, that you said it'd be a joke, is to make your brain think twice about what category names are in. Mm -hmm. And that's funny. Mm -hmm. And that's, that feels a, like a, a variant of looking a scan for the text of, of of understanding that what you think about a text is your own prism as much as it is anything in the text itself. And that feels very Jewish to me. It isn't, of course, exclusively Jewish or anything. But it feels very Jewish. And humor feels like a form of humor is a form of saying, we're told this, what if it was like this? You look at this, but I'm gonna say this instead. That's funny. That's what I think. Um, I made I made Edie Jewish. Um, and I suppose I made her Jewish for two reasons. One is because this is my first novel and I'm Jewish, and so I know that experience, and so that would probably be easier for me to write a Jewish character than it would be a non-Jewish character, or a character who comes from a distinct other religion. Um, but I also, I think part of why I love writing Jewish characters is because I get to put more Jews out there in the world <laughs> um, and have people exposed to them and read about Jewish people. Um, and I feel very proud of being Jewish. In Perth, I was the first Jew that a lot of people had met there. Um, and I felt a duty, like as you do when you travel outside of this country, you sort of feel a duty as an American to represent hopefully the best things about our country. <laughs> and um, I feel that way about being Jewish too. And so I feel proud to have Jewish characters in my book. Um, that being said, I'm writing a book right now. Um, and so far, the woman is not associated with any religion, and it is something that I'm wondering. Because I think it would be fun to try to write someone who has, um, like, you know, really strong, like, a Christmas tree tradition or something like that. It would be fun. Yeah. Because I do love a Christmas tree. Sorry, Rabbi. <laughs> I don't have one, but I love how they smell and they love the ornament. 
Sorry, Rabbi. It's a funny title. Sorry, Rabbi. Um, well, maybe we should end with uh, saying one thing we love about Sheriff Israel. Okay. Because we're in Sheriff Israel and it's been really good to us over the years. Yeah. Or a good memory you have of it. I have memories of hanging out in the um, women's lounge. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Probably with Jessica. Robert I remember Jessica I caught it in there. Was, there was like, there was like that ante room. Right? Really, really nice for female identifying folks who feel comfortable in the women's room. Check it out before you go. It's got a whole living room in there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was a, I remember that I caught like a magical glimpse of that when I was little. <laughs> I was like, man, we don't have that. I have great oh, memories of. Uh, what do you do? I don't know. It's obviously none of my business. I have great memories of braiding my dad's, uh, like, talit um, during services, playing with that. Yeah. Um, I think about this, maybe this is a good thing to end with, but, but I think about that when I was young. I was shown that the huge stained glass window up in the in the um, sanctuary, uh, what they use as Mount Sinai, Sinai is in fact half dome, um, and that the way that I learned that when I was young, I'm sure I wasn't taught it this way, but what filtered in was that it was like a mistake or like it was a goof. The way. You know, there's like anachronisms in a movie or something like that. And that, to, and then as I grew older, I learned that, of course, first of all, it's not like, like there's no such thing as like a huge mistake of an image that you make in a huge stained glass window that takes years to make. They're not like, oops, you know. But when you're young, you're like, I don't know, they made a stained glass window. They were like, oops, it's half dome. Like, I should have planned out that enormous stained glass window. Silly me. But that Who actually, put those golden arches accidentally. Yeah, <laughs> but that it's but that it was a um, it, you know it was a deep visual metaphor for thinking about um, where California and Judaism intersect and where and where and can you carry a part of an old homeland and an old story with you to a place and and, and most particularly in California, which is kind of known for its own constant reinvention slash amnesia. Um, and the thing, the fact that I didn't know, I didn't know where the name California came from. And that was something that I just thought, I must, I went to school here, obviously someone taught me where California came from. And California is a character in a novel. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and that was a beautiful thing to learn. Thanks for coming, everybody! <laughs>